Hello and welcome back to this third episode of our series on the Bach Cello Suite on Idagio Live. Today we will talk about the courant from the first suite and our guest uh, later in this episode in about 15 minutes will be Paolo Pandolfo who has realized an absolutely stunning uh, recording of a version of the suites for Viola da Gamba. And we will have an occasion to ask him how he did this and why. But now back to our courant, which by the way is a movement which is harmonically a bit less dense and a bit less complicated, I would say, than an Allemande or a Sarabande. And therefore, uh, we will talk about it, about a few things, and then we will have more time for questions that you sent me, uh, because I'm still a bit late in coping with your questions, for which I'm very grateful. Please keep sending them. That's very helpful uh, for me for this atelier. The big subject we will have now with the courant is gravity. So, in music, and the more you go back, I would say, in the history of music, and certainly in Baroque times, the sense of gravity, the sense of where the main beat is, well, it is called the downbeat, the downbeat, is, um, is something that plays a key role in music making, particularly in these suites which are made almost exclusively of dances. And in these dances, the downbeat is basically where the dancer would put his feet down and would touch the ground. Now, the paradox that we have to uh, face as cellists uh, in this subject and in, in these suites with Bach is that um, by nature, physiologically, on the cello, when you play a, a low register, you are playing down physiologically. My arm is there and I can... And on the contrary, when I play in the higher register, up, so I am physiologically up. So it seems that in a way we have it in a way more natural and easier than the violin and the violas with whom the instrument is put here. And then it's the contrary. When they play on the low register, they have to go up. And when they play on the high register, they have to go down. Now, what happens with many of the uh, movements of these uh, six suites, and particularly of the courant we are talking about today, is that very often uh, Bach likes to put the downbeat on the upper register, to start with his upper voice, which makes sense, of course. But that means for us, in a way, we have to, um, to cope with us and to manage to get the feeling of, of touching the ground of being done as we are playing on the upper string. So, uh, so as I play my upper note, I have to really give a sense of this is the downbeat and the two following notes, which are just, which are much less important because they are the middle of the beat and the second beat, which in the courant are not very important. Well, I have to be lighter in my playing. So, uh, and to, look at things physiologically, it would have been much easier for me to do uh, which is what he did in the prelude, remember? Uh, in the prelude we started down there and it somehow helps us to get into the piece um, in a more natural way. So <clears throat> I will, when I talk, when I look at the questions later that you sent me, uh, I will have the opportunity to uh, talk a bit also about this, about how, how we manage to have more weight, more contact in the bow when we are on the upper register. But uh, for now, just remember that uh, when you look at uh, these suites, what dance are you just playing? How is it grooving? Where, do you, where does the dance uh, really touch the ground? And then try to apply this to your bow technique. All right? So, um, now, 
before we go to this to your to your very to your questions I will um, catch I will try to pull your attention to uh, three little passages in this courant first of all I will play a little bit uh... <laughs> So this is our opening and did you see that basically in almost all the bars here we are almost always from the top, right? Uh, from the top, from the top, so this is really the mantra of this courant. Um, there is one passage that I find um, exciting at the end of the first part of this courant. It's that after a sort of a few virtuoso things, he gets stuck on a pedal note. You remember we talked about pedal note in the prelude, where there is this very impressive uh, long pedal note, which occupies the whole second half of the piece. Remember, but that pedal in the prelude was one that was very. Uh, unrhythmical. It was one that was there to let us improvise. To let us free, right? Here, Bach makes, in a way, the contrary. He puts a pedal note, but with the bass note being repeated every beat. So, did you hear? So it's a short pedal note, two bars, which in a courant is almost nothing. But see how with this, uh, this uh, Bach wants to bring a lot of rhythm and of, of groove in his music, although the term <coughs> is not historically correct. I apologize for this. But um, that's a way for him to, to, to create again excitement, which is also what he was doing with this big pedal in the prelude. Uh, and then the cadenza. Uh, what's interesting is that this element, he brings it again at the end of the second part, but what comes afterwards is, of course, a different term, and this uh, a different turn, and this is something that Bach will do very often uh, in he, in these suites. You will see, as we talk about other movements, that um, he uses elements in the second half that have been presented in the first half, but almost always in a different order, so that one and the same element gets a very different light and a very different meaning. So, remember here, after... We had, so to say, the end of the piece. Here... And here, we should, so to say, finish. And instead, he brings an element, you probably remember it from the beginning, so that's an element that was in our very opening. Uh, and that's, I find it so wonderful how Bach uh, brings the same cards, but he brings them in a different order, and then the music is different. That's part of, of this extraordinary. Uh, unlimited, continuous inventivity. Uh, the last uh, little example um, I want to show you, uh, which I find very sweet as well, is uh, in the second part of the courant, there is a moment where Bach does a little waving at the prelude and says, hello prelude, uh, we remember you. So I will play this passage. Uh, now, listen. Uh, which, if you remember, in the prelude, almost the same music, except in the prelude we are in four beats, and here we are in three beats. And then we go different. Uh, and here, um, uh, after this 
sort of little Träumerei uh, greeting to the prelude, he brings what we call, what I call again in historically wrong term, a walking bass, uh, which is um, when the bass after we, we had harmonies one harmony per bar, so one harmony per bar, one chord per bar, and then suddenly the bass get, gets very active to bring us to a big cadenza and then to the next episode. So see how suddenly the bass after being yeah, suddenly uh, so, uh, bring you a lot of drive. Uh, this is something that is important for us cellists who, who play this wonderful piece in order to, to yeah, I think if we are aware of that, we will very naturally bring uh, an, an energy at this place and that will help us to conduct the phrase. So, I would like to use the fact that we have uh, five more minutes before uh, having our guest on this show to go to your questions. Uh, the first subject will be articulation in relation with phrasing. Uh, there are two questions that I will bring together. One question is from David. How do you articulate fast notes while preserving the larger pulse? And the question by Pierre Depp, which is in a way the same question a bit more developed. How to practice and create this impression of long phrases within which there are all these elements, both rhythmical and melodic, typical of the suites. In other words, how can I preserve the melodic, which seems to be very important, and the character of the dances at the same time? Sometimes I work a lot to bring out elements of detail, articulation, and then I listen to myself and it seems uh, uh, cut and we lose the phrase. Well, um, which is a subject I find fascinating as a cellist because uh, this is both a technical and, um, and physiological aspect. So, the, the, the answer to this, in my view, is that uh, we were made, uh, lucky us, with uh, many articulations. So there is this one, there is this one, there is uh, the wrist, of course, and then we, in the fingers we have three articulations, yes? And if you use all of them, you have the possibility to have the large groove, the large swing of the music with the upper part of your body and the first part of the arm, I would say. So in this case, let's say we are in our courant. See arm here in my upper part of the body, I, I am really swinging by the bar. So, my, so to, to keep the, the long breathing and the phrasing, my arm can do maybe this quarter note and then I go down in the different articulations and the faster the notes within this, uh, the smaller the articulation. So I should do then, for example, if I do eighth notes, now you see that the lateral movement is only from the hand and the fingers and then if I have sixteenth note, uh, it's only the fingers that do the 16th note. And this is something I cannot insist uh, enough on because if what, what happens very often is that we, pay, we don't pay attention enough to this and then we play. And then if my whole arm is involved in doing small notes, I lose the the phrasing and the broad breathing of the music. So now we're going for one minute. This is going to be very cellistic uh, before we, we go and talk to, to Paolo. Uh, but I will give you, share with you, four exercises that uh, I always share with my students, uh, which is basically this. We have the tendency uh, in all these different articulations, we have the tendency to privilege the arm motion and sometimes the forearm but 
these here, what the Germans call uh, Kleinmotorik, the, the, the small mechanics here in the hand, they don't get enough attention. So to warm up in the morning, I myself uh, still every day take uh, maybe half a minute or a minute to activate this, to make sure this is going to be very active in my playing. And for this, there are four exercises. The first one I do is the rolling and I slowly roll the bow in my fingers. And this one is mainly the intention is that you get in contact with the bow with the tip of your fingers uh, in order to really remember that with the tip of your fingers you can do a lot of things. So get in touch because sometimes some of us and I have also in my in, in many years when I was young I got a bit stuck in a position where my only contact to the bow was this part and then the, all the rest of the fingers was just like basically in the way. So sometimes we do want to go deep in the bow, we might talk about this later, but very often in particular in Bach where we want articulation, it's important to be in touch with the tip of the fingers. So the rolling and do always this quite slowly. Next one is this. Uh, make sure that you don't do the movement with your forearm like this. That's not good. Do it, do it with your fingers. If you want, help yourself by holding this part. And with your fingers, let the bow go way down and then way up and then way down. This is going to be super important for uh, string changes, that you don't do the string changes with your whole, uh, whole arm. Um, and then there is this one, the lateral one, which is also only with the fingers, bring the tip of the bow towards there and towards back towards yourself. This is also very important for the contact on the string of the sound. You don't want to have always the same angle on the strings. You want to be able to vary it to serve your contact. I will try to develop this in a future episode. And the last one is which is almost the most important for all we talked about now, uh, the articulation, which is this one. Uh, go to the extreme, you know, throw your, your, your bow to the right and then back to the left. And when you go to the left, please don't hesitate to get out of your cello holding position. Don't hold your bow. This I will repeat also other times. Having one position that stays always when we hold the bow is very contraproductive. So please dare to go very far there out of your usual bow position and to go in extremes. And this will be very important for you to do small articulations while keeping the long phrasing. Um, I had the intention to talk about bowings, but as uh, it seems to happen to me quite often, I developed too much on the articulation and phrasing relationship and therefore I will stop there today with the questions but on a future episode I will talk about bowings which is a long subject and you have sent me many questions. I would say most of the questions you sent me were about uh, the bowings. But for now I want to have enough time to talk, uh, talk to our guest uh, Paolo so I come closer to uh, the phone and I put on my headphones Dear Paolo, are you there with us? Yeah, I am. Hello. Yes, hello, hello Paolo. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time to come um, to our series. Um, I'm so thrilled. Um, you know, I, I know I, I repeat myself a little bit, but I have all my students hear about uh, your recording because I find it so uh, and such an, an enrichment for a cellist to see how uh, what what you did in transcribing in a way and then you'll tell me if you agree with this term or not but the suites for the viola da gamba which has a different tuning which has a, a different capacities and you um, of course sometimes you you uh, enrich some chords uh, in order to make them more fitting um, with the Viola da Gamba. And you, I find what you did with ornaments absolutely fantastic. And so I find it uh, very inspiring for a cellist 
to listen to the recording, uh, apart from the fact that it's just wonderful. So, would you like to tell us, first of all, how did you come to the crazy idea to play all the six suites on the Viola da Gamba, and, and how did you proceed? Well, <clears throat> it's a very long story and it started when I was still a student, actually. Uh, I, I, I was a student of Jordi Saval, the famous Viola da Gamba player, and he also was uh, uh, doing some of the suites. And th this intrigued me uh, very much. And so together we thought, let's work on, uh, on suite uh, number five. Why start on number five? Because number five exists in a different version for lute, in a different key, it's in G minor. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and uh, being this instrument, kind of something between a lute, the, when you see the frets and the many strings, it's exactly the same, the same tuning of a, of a lute, mm -hmm. uh, except one string more, if it's seven strings. So it's, that's a lute played with bow, basically. So uh, a, a good start, it's probably to start from a suite where, which exists also for lute and see what did Bach, do in changing the, the, two, the two versions. In the, in, the, in the lute version, you have uh, in counterpoints, uh, more bass running, ba walking basses while the, the, high, the high part is, uh, is doing uh, melodic uh, work. And, uh, and so it being this uh, kind of compromise instrument between a plucked one and a string one, having both capabilities, uh, this brought me to discover this suites as a fantastic field of, of uh, yeah, musical beauty. On the other hand, there is another thing which is very special for this instrument, which is the enormous amount. Now, I, I mean, I was, uh, yeah, a few books. Uh, now we have dozens and dozens of, of suites, uh, hundreds of suites in our repertoire. And they, most of, of them, they, they have this exact uh, frame of Prelude, Allemand, Courant, Sarabande, uh, Gigue, I mentioned Inouette, Gavotte, uh, et cetera. So this form is very much bound together to the vial. So in a way, if uh, as a viol player, you spent a long time playing all those suites by all those authors, more unknown authors before Bach, and the most known, well-known for gamble players would be Maham Marais, but there are many others, of course, then you land into this new um, uh, landscape, Bach suites landscape, and uh, all of a sudden you recognize, oh, this is an Armel, this is a Courant, this is a Sarabande, this is a Gigue. And, uh, and uh, we kind of have a little bit more of uh, tools to, to understand the writing. So in the, in the very uh, general uh, shape of the form suite, this sequence of dances, because we should really not forget that those dances were danced. It was like a craziness about dancing suites in, in these uh, cards. Maybe short before, maybe a few suites were only meant to be played, but the listener, if you would listen to a Goran, we needed to recognize a Goran. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the same for each of those dances. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the link to the dance is extremely important. And, uh, and the other thing which is extremely interesting is that the uh, vocabulary that uh, Johann Sebastian Bach uh, uses for the uh, suites and also for the partitas of Berlin, uh, in a way, is this very complex mixture of melodic and polyphonic writing. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in this mixture of polyphony and melodic, uh, work, we are completely at home. That's where the viol, the Gamba, 
develops its whole repertoire. So we, um, if, if we play a Marais suite, a folk Ray suite, uh, and, uh, or before Saint Colombe and, and uh, De Machy, et cetera, uh, they sometimes really explain you how to deal with those big jumps that very often are not jumps, it's just going from one voice to another. Music with the big M is, <clears throat> in this time, polyphony. And this writing is mean at least two, if not three voices, but it's hidden. You don't have three voices play, sing, playing all the time together. And polyphony is not very often, very often we think the polyphony is when chords are there. Not really, chords are very often just a ornament, a, a sound ornament, but polyphony is when voices are dialoguing. And so you rarely see voices together, but you very often see voices uh, answering to each other. And there are <clears throat> so many examples of this in our repertoire that again, we say, okay, ding, bom, bom, ding. so it goes, so this is uh, treble in the middle, bass, uh, da -da 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 and I know, the treble and ding, bom, answering bass, da -da -ding, dum, bom, and, and then and there is always the answer of the bass and we have, also techniques to, 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 to use resonance in order to keep the voices resonating while the other voices are uh, answering. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not impossible. It's not possible. And so the many compromises are uh, necessary very often. Mm -hmm. So this is why uh, it's, a, it's a new landscape. And in the same time you recognize, uh, it's like seeing your own uh, um, uh, country from another, uh, slightly under another point of view, and uh, through the incredible imagination and architecture capability of a genius like Jan Sebastian Bach. Mm -hmm. so this is why uh, it was like not possible to resist the temptation of, uh, of do this project. <laughs> well, we are very, very happy that you didn't resist. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy you, you talked about all these subjects. We, we have started in the first episode to talk about this polyphony, but of course in future episodes we will develop, and this is such a fascinating um, subject in this suite. Uh, also, I was very intrigued when you talked about the resonance aspect, and also in future episodes I want, I want to show... I also think, uh, as you said, I think the, the, the Viola da Gamba has, has more be, maybe because simply you have more strings, but you, you have more capacities for resonance, for resonating uh, as, as we do. And, uh, and we, have, we also have to develop, um, in a way, artifacts sometimes to create resonance, which I find a very interesting subject in bow technique. Um, my question to you would be, was there uh, one suite uh, that that was more challenging in the transcribe in the transcription to, to put to make it work on the on the Viola da Gamba that's my and in the same question was there one where it was actually more natural so as, as a cellist uh, intuitively I would say the sixth suite which is uh, written for the you know for the cello with the fifth uh, upper string was it for example the one that that was the most evident to, to make work on the, on the Viola da Gamba? Uh, I would say not really. Uh, there was quite a lot of work and it was a lot of thinking because uh, uh, then I have been a little bit working on also with scordaturas, mm -hmm. uh, so detuning some of the strings. For instance, uh, in, in the version of the third suite, which I do in F major, in the recording, not in my concerts because it becomes complicated, but in the recording, I was uh, uh, tuning differently the sixth uh, and the seventh string. Um, it does work perfectly also without that. It, again, it's, it's for getting more resonances on certain important notes. Uh, what happens in the sixth suite is that uh, Bach is very aware of the tuning of the cello piccolo. So you have a high E, so you have fifth, fifth. E, A, D, and, uh, and, and uh, the suite is in D major, 
And uh, many of the of the games with pe open strings pedals uh, happen with one of those open strings. So I was very tempted to, to as we are very close, I could have tuned uh, from the middle A, from, from the high A, instead of having a D, I could have tuned an E. And, uh, and then in instead of having a, 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 an E, I could have had a D. In that case, I would like, changed my violin into a fretted uh, cello piccolo almost. And I thought this is not going to make good, good service to the viol. Also because this suite is in D major and D major is as the key for the viol. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had to work a lot on those passages where the open E strings, for instance, is needed, and sometimes bring them an octave lower because here is an E, an open E string. And so I wouldn't say that was uh, easier. It was actually more work to work on the sixth suite. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's very challenging suite, as we all know. It goes extremely high and it's uh, classic to play that, that instrument. That, that's it. Uh, otherwise, I would say, uh, as a starting point, uh, having as a starting point uh, to suite number five, where I could compare the flute version and uh, the cello version, mm -hmm. uh, using those uh, main uh, ideas, I went through one by one, by one uh, through the others, and. Uh, I think they all now are uh, in, a, in a way very, very natural on the file and they are starting to become um, standard repertoire for certain uh, uh, viol players and I think it's, it's very, very nice. It yeah. sounds very much now that, that it now belongs um, to your instrument just as much as to ours. Um, uh, before I, I, I posted uh, this afternoon that I was that you are going to be our guest uh, today, and uh, uh, my friend Nirina uh, uh, wrote, "Oh, I listen to him every day," uh, oh, so I, I'm, I'm so excited. So we can greet uh, Nirina, and um, Paolo, It was wonderful to have you here. Unfortunately, we, it's it would be so wonderful to ask you even more about about this. But what I think most important is that. Uh, Everybody out there goes and listen to your uh, so inspiring recording. You create worlds, you create also in terms of uh, ornaments. Uh, uh, you, you do such inspiring things and, and I've, I've received quite many questions about ornamentation. So when I will go to, uh, to these questions, I will certainly um, again um, um, talk about your recording as a great source of inspiration. So thank you so much, uh, Paolo. And, uh, and thank you. And everybody, uh, I'll see you on Tuesday at 5.30 for the next episode. And we will talk, of course, about the Sarabande of the first suite. And we will again have a surprise guest. See you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>